Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this briefing at the Jerusalem Press Club. I'm Talia Deco, CEO. With Israel well into the fourth month of its war against Hamas following the October 7th massacre, international credit over its extended operation hangs in question and sturdy relations with its most important ally are more critical than ever. Here today to discuss the current situation and diplomatic regional efforts to effectively finish the crisis while maintaining Israeli security is the White House's former special envoy to the Middle East, the Honorable Jason Greenblatt. Hello, Mr. Greenblatt. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us while traveling in Dubai. Thank you for having me, Talia. Thank you to those who have joined. Um, Mr. Greenblatt, since the introduction of the now shelved legal reform, uh, the relationship between Jerusalem and Washington seems to have been marked with tension, yet this faded at the beginning of the war with President Biden's immediate show of support for Israel's right to defend itself in the face of the atrocities. Um, do you think that recent statements like Secretary Blinken's warning to Israel over its treatment of the Palestinians during the war, and even today's report uh, over the president's internal remarks about Netanyahu uh, are a signal of a resurgence of differences? Yes, they do concern me. And let me start by saying that I've been somebody who, though worked in the Trump administration, I'm a strong supporter of President Trump. I believe he did excellent things for Israel. I've also consistently complimented President Biden and his entire administration since October 7th for how they've handled Israel's war on Hamas. But I would say over the last week or so, there are things that concern me deeply. Uh, Secretary Blinken's comment about dehumanizing Palestinians is an outrageous comment that is certainly not Israel's intention. That feeds right into those who falsely claim that Israel is committing a genocide against Palestinians. It feeds into the anti-Semitism that's surging around the world. It feeds into unfair, uh, absolutely ridiculous anti-Israel sentiment. I think those comments were irresponsible. Um, there are reports that Secretary Blinken is now reviewing um, recognizing a Palestinian state in some fashion, perhaps unilaterally. I don't know if those reports are accurate or not. I think that would be a terrible mistake, first of all, a betrayal of Israel, and just a terrible mistake, and it's not going to bring peace any closer. It will not benefit the Palestinians other than politically. I think them trying to constrain Israel, for example, their warnings about Rafa, are also dangerous, dangerous to Israel, dangerous to the IDF, dangerous to the hostages, so uh, I've definitely seen um, uh, more daylight coming between the U.S. government, which was so uh, useful and helpful, and I'm proud as an American for what they did. Uh, now, uh, I think there was one part that I did answer, which was um, something about Pre uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Maybe if you could repeat that part. There were, there were just reports about um, internal discussions um, and some name calling uh, between them. So Look, I, uh, having been in the White House for a couple of years and knowing how people say things and leak and this and that, hard for me to really respond to that because I don't know what actually happened and I like to talk about what I know rather than speculation. Okay, thank you for that. Um, you mentioned uh, Rafah um, and of course we all saw the operation overnight in which two Israeli hostages were, were actually released uh, during a, a very daring um, military maneuver. Do you think that this kind of um, operation that we see that hostages are being kept in civilian areas, uh, in cities in the southern Gaza Strip, could perhaps change something in the in in um, in uh, the administration's policy about Israel's ability to operate there um, now that they are seeing what's going on? Well, it should remind the administration, it should remind the world that it's not just Hamas itself those who hide and embed themselves in civilian populations. But there are civilians themselves, probably way too many among Palestinians in Gaza who are participating, who participated in the atrocities of October 7, who are participating in holding hostages. This is not the first report that we heard about hostages being held by, I'm not even sure using the word civilians is appropriate because I think by doing what they're doing, they, act, they became uh, almost combatants in, in this war. Um, I think that what Israel did, as it often is able to do, is remarkable in terms of rescuing the hostages. I hope that they're able to do more of this. Um, and I think the government, the U.S. government, that is, should, again, turn itself to fully supporting Israel, allowing it to do what it needs to do to rescue the hostages and try to, I don't want to say defeat Hamas, that's too vague uh, a terminology. It's not something that's necessarily achievable. But degrading Hamas to such an extent that it can't attack Israel again, 
and trying to get as many of its leaders uh, and fighters uh, as it can. But the, the tall order of destroying Hamas, I think, is a difficult task to achieve. Understood. I just want to um, get a little bit more on what you were saying before in terms of the the daylight, uh, the growing daylight between uh, the administration and the government. Is is there an explanation for this, in your opinion? Does it have anything to do with um, with internal American politics, uh, perhaps with the progressive uh, um, flank of the of the Democratic Party? Any any thoughts on that? My assessment is a lot about politics. In fact, during the time that I was highly complimentary about President Biden and his administration, I often said much to his detriment because it became clear that there was a flank of uh, of the Democratic Party that was hugely against President Biden's policies when it came to supporting Israel in this war. Um, as President Biden and his staff, his campaign staff, see that a race, a matchup, with President Trump is going to become quite the fight. Uh, I think they're more and more concerned that they need every single vote. And this is their way of trying to kowtow to those people who are against his policies. And I think that's shameful. Um, it's a betrayal of an ally, an important ally, Israel. And it's shameful to, uh, to what happened on October 7 and the memory of those who were slaughtered and the hostages themselves. And about the calls for a Palestinian state, is this a reasonable request given given the atrocities that we just spoke about who who would run uh who would run such a state and what is your vision on that well first of all it plays right into the hands of the Iranian regime and Hamas itself they're basically rewarding Hamas for the kind of activity the atrocious acts the barbaric acts that they did i can't even begin to understand how somebody thought of that idea and i hope it dies very quickly on the vine um but what they must be thinking about is, number one, is it going to be Hamas? Of course not. Should it be a corrupt, ineffective, very unpopular Palestinian authority? Why would they ever do something like that? What would the borders be? What would the state actually mean? I think it's an exercise in uh, futility. I think all it is is some sort of uh, political scorecard that President Biden can then turn to that left flank and perhaps the voters, certain voters in Michigan and say, look what I've done for you. I'm even handed. And this is the problem that we've always had with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Everybody always tries to be equal. There's a moral equivalence that people try to um, uh, to do their acrobatics to perform. And uh, it's not, not only not helpful to Israel, it's not at all helpful to Palestinians. It doesn't give Palestinians the better lives that they deserve, the prosperity that they deserve. And I think it's not only a complete waste of time, but it's going to cause more damage to Israel and the Palestinians and the wider region. One journalist is asking specifically about uh, about a Dutch court's ban on uh, on U.S. owned parts for F-35 uh, stealth fighter jets, uh, a ban that's supposed to go into effect in seven days. Uh, if you can comment on this and does the U.S. Uh, produce or provide F-35 parts to anyone else in the world and how this would if impact Israeli military operations, if you're able to answer that. I'm sorry, I'm not tracking it, so I can't answer. Okay, uh, you mentioned earlier about um, uh, uh, Iran and 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 uh, in the context of a uh, Palestinian state being a gift to Iran. But if we can perhaps tie um, tie Iran uh, to to what's happening vis-a-vis uh, -vis the U.S. Uh, and its uh, activities against its proxies in the region, whether it's in Iraq or against uh, against the Houthis, do you think that the current U U.S. administration is doing uh, what it should be doing against those threats, those threats to America? No, not at all. I mean, I'm glad to see they're finally taking some action. But, you know, they went into the administration thinking they could do a deal with Iran. They had a mindset as the Obama administration had, that they could actually do a deal with Iran. And at the, with the right deal, the Iranian regime would change course and hold hands with everybody and sing songs of peace. They had no understanding of what the Iranian regime is not only capable of, but interested in doing, which is, of course, not only to destroy the Jewish state of Israel, but to really take over this region entirely and impose its version of Islam on the entire region. Um, they finally started acting against the Houthis, uh, but their first mistake was delisting the Houthis as terrorists. Now they realize that the Houthis are causing tremendous damage and uh, costs and, uh, you know, all sorts of impact on shipping. So everything always seems to be too little too late 
when it comes to the U.S.'s approach with respect to the Iranian regime and its proxies. There was also, um, I don't want to say denial, but almost denial that the Iranian regime had any uh, impact, had any involvement with October 7. Even if the Iranian regime didn't know exactly when it was going to happen, Hamas wouldn't exist and Hezbollah wouldn't exist and the Houthis wouldn't exist or be able to do anything unless the Iranian regime was there, funding them, training them, supporting them, and encouraging them to go about their death, uh, their destructive ways. Uh, so bringing the conversation back to us locally, you mentioned Hezbollah. Um, do you think that uh, the U.S. will will do anything or is doing anything to deter um, a spillover of the of the current uh, situation on Israel's northern borders, which, as we know, obviously there there is a war going on there. There are rockets still being fired every day at Israeli homes and areas on the north. Um, do you have any indication that there's, you know, that the U.S. is involved in trying to to prevent uh, that from getting any worse? Well, I would give President Biden credit for initially sending those two carriers. I think that was a strong message to Hezbollah to uh, stay out of it. Uh, I was disappointed to see that one of the carriers was sent back. I haven't tracked it recently, um, but I think that one thing that isn't really discussed enough is after this war on Hamas, Hezbollah remains there. It's a major threat to Israel. The type of rockets that they have, the number of rockets that they have, the threat that they have to Israel uh, does have to be faced one day. Just hiding away from it and pretending it doesn't exist leads us to a much worse situation than, hap than has happened on October 7th. I don't think the Biden administration, certainly not before the election, is going to have any stomach for Israel to do something. But I think for us, for anyone to pretend that that threat isn't there and that Israel might have to act in some way, shape or form uh, uh, is silly. And I hope that the U.S. will support Israel. I hope they work together to figure out how to reduce that threat. Do you think that um, at the end of the day, the U.S. could uh, could abstain or vote against Israel in any at any point at the U.N.? Or do you think that's not something we're going to see repeated uh, during the near future or as this war plays out? Very hard to speculate. I mean, the Obama vote or the Obama betrayal at the UN, I should say, before President Trump came into office after he ele he was elected, shocked most people. Um, I don't know enough about the inner workings of the Biden administration to conjecture that. But I think anything they do at the UN that is not fully supportive of Israel and is just there to give a win to either the Palestinians or to terrorism, Hezbollah or otherwise, would be a big mistake for America uh, and a, and our allies and friends in the Middle East will definitely notice that. And if there's one thing I could say when we came into office in 2017, is that most of the Middle East felt betrayed by the Obama administration. Anything the Biden administration does that's going to betray Israel is likely to feel a, like a betrayal to most of the Middle East, even though some of them will potentially like any kind of vote at the UN that goes against Israel. How does this, though, fit into the greater context of, of, of the U.S. In the, in the family of nations? For instance, if uh, there is a vote at, at uh, the ICJ against Israel, not a vote, sorry, decision against Israel at the ICJ, and we see other uh, other international players coming out against Israel, the U.S. won't be able to, to you know, remain the, the lone uh, de defender of Israel. Don't you think that this pressure uh, might, might push the U.S. into that stage at the end of the day as well? I don't think so. I think the U.S. is the, remains the most powerful country in the world. Uh, we shouldn't take our guidance from countries like South Africa or other countries who are both cynical and uh, do everything from a political perspective. So I think the U.S. needs to stand strong and tall, stand by its allies regardless of what the other countries are saying. If other countries want to accuse the U.S. of uh, giving up its leadership role in the world, I think that's false. I think they come knocking on the doors of the U.S., of the doors of the White House all the time, regardless of the U.S. positions. So I think what we're reading in the press that suggests what you're talking about is just words. It's, they're meaningless. And uh, uh, like President Trump did, I hope President Biden remains strong in the face of any kind of accusation or threats like that or uh, sullying the United States name. All of it is unfair, uh, inappropriate, and completely untrue. And what about the most recent uh, decision by the by the White House to sanction uh, for 
Israelis uh, living in the settlements? Is this something that you think we're going to see uh, developing into into a pattern, or was this just kind of like a one off to pay lip service to to pressures coming internally? Uh, my guess is we're going to see more of it. I think it's a mistake. I think very often they've tried to um, use this moral equivalence or pretend that the violence by certain Israelis who live in Judea and Samaria is equal to the violence of Palestinians uh, or terrorism. I think that's also false. Uh, I think that, well, by the way, I should say that I'm against all of that violence. I think it's a terrible thing that they do. I think it's also terrible for Israel's reputation. But to suggest that it's the same as what's happening on the Palestinian side, I think is wrong. And again, feeds into the narrative that Israel oppresses Palestinians intentionally, uh, murders Palestinians intentionally. All of that is just false. And one journalist is bringing us back to the issue of the Palestinian state and asking that, isn't it in Israel's, uh, as well as the US's interest at the end of the day to, to seek a peaceful uh, resolution uh, that would in fact see to um, Palestinians being able to to achieve self determination, um, and 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 isn't it also in the interest to win the hearts and minds of the Palestinians, um, and how this can be achieved in the current crisis? Uh, let me try to unpack that. Um, winning the hearts and minds of the Palestinians, of course. Except, which hearts and minds? I mean, the hearts and minds, giving them a state that makes no sense for Israel or for the region, a state that could threaten Israel the way. Uh, the way Gaza, the way Hamas stand, if you will, threatened Israel, no, then they could uh, keep their hearts and minds, if you will. I think no ally should ask another ally to put themselves in danger the way Israel has been from the moment of its inception, really, from even before it was formed. As far as uh, your first question, uh, isn't it in the U.S. interest and everybody's interest for there to be, um, um, this is a misquote, I didn't quite get to quote you were saying, but something better for the future of everybody, of course. The problem is, the devil is always in the details. That's why when we were at the White House, we put together a plan, which some people loved and some people hated, but it was a very detailed plan of a potential future. I think it was some 60 or 70 pages plus a very large economic plan that explained how we could chart a better future. But just to lob out the world words, two-state solution, or now they're using words like independent Palestinian state, all of that is meaningless without the details. Am I in favor of charting a better course for Palestinians so they could have as successful lives as Israelis have, as Israelis have been able to build? Absolutely. The question is, how do we get there? How do we get there with the right leadership among Palestinians, which does not exist today? It certainly doesn't exist in Gaza, and it doesn't exist in the Palestinian areas of Judea and Samaria. And how do we get there where we can figure out, is there a solution to the extraordinarily complex thorny problems that have always been the issues, whether it's Jerusalem or borders, or whether Palestinians have a right to have arms or no arms, demilitarized, not demilitarized. There are many, many issues. You're all familiar with this if you're on this call. And the problem is without good faith negotiations, nothing good will happen to anybody. And what are you hearing in your meetings right now uh, where you're currently, um, where, where you currently are? Um, Obviously, the the war in Gaza sidelined uh, the progress of the of the Abraham Accords, at least in terms of public uh, public progress. Um, what can you share in terms of where we might be headed? Well, the Gulf countries remain extremely committed to the Palestinians. It's no secret. Some support the concept of a two state solution more strongly than others, but they're they're deeply pained by what's happening in Gaza. There's no question about it. They're all upset to see the images that we all see on television, depending on which stations uh, you're watching. At the same time, they also recognize what Hamas did was horrible. Um, I think that more needs to be done to connect the Israeli government with the Gulf for them to explain, as they do often to the U.S., why they're doing what they're doing, what their plans are, what their plans are for the day after. I know Israel has been reluctant to talk about the day after, and I'm not even talking about the day after in terms of not, you know, get every detail down. I think it's time that Israel should sit ideally with its Arab partners in Israel, I'm sorry, in the United States, and figure out what is a realistic day after? How do we let Palestinians come back to some semblance of normal living? What does the future look like? How does Israel keep its security? And I think it's time that those conversations started to happen, even if the war itself against Hamas is going, continue, going to continue for a longer period.
And what about uh, the, you know, the, uh, the chances of making, perhaps bringing other players into, into the accords? Is that something that, uh, that is feasible? Uh, if not tomorrow, then uh, when this whole thing is over? Well, before October 7, I think President Biden seemed to have been making some degree of progress, which of course was exciting. I think since October 7, it's put tremendous pressure on this region. And of course, this week we saw Saudi Arabia release a statement that uh, went backwards in terms of the types of demands that they've asked for before. Uh, they specifically called out John Kirby from the National Security Council. I think they seem to have been annoyed or angered that John Kirby aired the whatever discussions they may have been having in public. One of the things we learned at the White House very quickly was we were protecting something incredibly delicate and uh, much to the perhaps annoyance and aggravation of the press, we didn't leak and we very rarely aired anything that was being discussed. Um, and I always apologize to the press for that, but it seemed that John Kirby, um, uh, what's that expression? Loose lips sink, sh sink ships. So the Saudi Arabian statement was a very strong statement. Um, between now and election day, I think it's gonna be hard to roll that back unless somehow miraculously the war against Hamas ends quickly and there's enough time for President Biden to put all the pieces back together. So uh, assuming that won't happen and, and we, we're talking about something more long-term uh, in, the, in, the, in the further future, uh, would such a such an arrangement also see to perhaps um, the more moderate Palestinians, what, maybe the PA being involved in a, in a more comprehensive agreement, or that's just not not realistic. I think the PA is law. I think Palestinians writ large, but the PA especially lost tremendously by not taking part in the Abraham Accords. Among the groups that could have had so much benefit from the Abraham Accords were the Palestinians, even without peace with Israel. I think that if they don't step up to the plate, if by chance, whether it's President Biden before the election or whoever the next president's going to be after the election, if they don't step up and try to become partners in whatever the Abraham Accords uh, might be, if we're so lucky to get there, they're just once again missing out on the opportunity. I think it's time that they stopped trying to get everything that they want at the same moment and step-by-step step trying to win gains for the people so that people could have better lives, better economies, better jobs, better standards of living, and over time continue to, you wanna say fight, I don't mean physical gunfighting, but argue for, I have to be very careful uh, using words like that. But um, you know, negotiate is probably the best word I could use, negotiate for a future that they want with Israel. But I think, Many Palestinians that I speak to realize that the tactics that they've been using for so many years have failed. They're looking for something different. They have no power. They're afraid to use their voice, but they believe that their leadership has utterly failed them and they're incredibly disappointed. So I'll just ask one last follow-up question. Is there anything that the Americans could do perhaps to help bring those voices uh, to the mainstream uh, to, to, you know, to encourage them to to speak out um, or they're on it on their own? It's very hard. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you, I did a video, uh, we just released it this week, where I brought a Palestinian activist to visit Kfar Aza because I wanted the world, especially the Arab world, to hear directly from a Palestinian what happened at Kfar Aza. Uh, we released it on Newsweek, and uh, I think people here have been very shocked by the discussion because here's a person who by no means... He's totally supportive of what Palestinian demands are. He wants a future Palestinian state. I didn't get into the details of what that might look like with him, but he has no shrinking violet for what he wants for Palestinian people. But he had no problem expressing deep regret uh, for what happened on October 7, saying it doesn't represent the Palestinians. How much he really represents Palestinians, I don't know. You know, there's been terrible polling about where Palestinians are in terms of October 7. Maybe the polling is flawed. He believes the polling is flawed. The problem is he's one of the few, perhaps the only voice, but let's say the few voices who are willing to be brave enough to go out there and speak like that. It's hard for an American administration, having been there, to convince Palestinians to speak out loud. But I hope his bravery, um, his going to Kfar Aza, 
uh, in, you know, pushes Palestinians to say, we don't stand for what October 7th was. We do want a better future. We may want things that Israel can't give us. We may want things that Israel won't give us, but we do want something different and we don't want to go with violence or things like October 7th or um, not being willing to negotiate in good faith. I just don't know how many Palestinians will really have the courage to step forward and do that and how many even feel the way this gentleman, Samer Sinjawali, feels. Very clear, very succinct, and I think that's a good place to end. Honorable Jason Greenblatt, former White House Special Envoy to the Middle East, thank you so much for your time again, and good luck in your endeavors. Thank you for hosting me. I appreciate it. Thank you for everyone who attended. Okay, and thank you also to my colleagues, Esti Yari, Eli Klatstein, and Matthias Sakal for facilitating this call, as well as to everyone who joined in. Good evening.